Hi, I'm Matt Sprague, host of the Connected Construction Show, and I have a special announcement for our audience. This November 7th through the 9th, Trimble is hosting their Dimensions User Conference at the Venetian in Las Vegas, and they've just given us two tickets valued at over $1,700 each to give away to our audience. So how can you win? Simply share your favorite episode on any social media platform using the hashtag ccshow underscore favorite and include why that's your favorite episode and you'll be eligible to win. The shared post with the most amount of likes will win two free tickets to Dimension 2022. Five runners up will receive a special Connected Construction Show t-shirt and sticker. So get out there and share your favorite episode before October 21st. We will announce the winner live on the show Tuesday, October 25th. Again, share your favorite episode on any social media platform using the hashtag ccshow underscore favorite and include why that's your favorite episode before October 21st in order to have a chance to win the two tickets to Dimensions in Las Vegas. Good luck and stay connected. From Trimble Construction, you're listening to The Connected Construction Show, where we connect you to the contractors, owners, designers, engineers, and construction professionals who are finding better ways to work. And now, Here's your host, Matt Sprague. Hello and welcome back to the Connected Construction Show. I'm your host, Matt Sprague. Very excited for this week's guest. We have uh, CEO of BuildWit. We have Aaron Witt with us today. Aaron, welcome. Thanks for having me. Super, super excited to be talking to you today. Yeah, thank you. So tell us uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your background? Um what your current role is, what you've been up to. Sure. I am a kid that loves bulldozers and started a, a company taking pictures of them. I'm, I'm the son of a tax attorney, so I didn't grow up, grow up blue collar one, one bit, uh, but was fortunately given the opportunity by my parents to pursue whatever career path I wanted to pursue. Uh, I fell in love with construction since I was a little kid for whatever reason. And uh, there was a construction project in my neighborhood when I was 17, senior in high school, and I called the owner of the company and asked for a job. And that's how I started my construction career. So my, my plan was to go work for a bunch of construction companies, get construction experience, and then start a construction company, because how hard can it be? And that would give me the ability to go run equipment whenever I wanted to. It would have my name on it. So in theory, I could, I could go get in it whenever, whenever uh, I felt like it. And uh, so I, I got an engineering degree, worked for five different large contractors, and then everything took a, a terribly wrong turn when I started to post pictures on the internet. So I, I took my experiences from the construction industry, started to share them online. People really started to like it. One, two, six, I end up quitting my job, starting to take pictures of really any company that would let me on their job sites, posting them online and then ended up building a marketing business. So over the past, that was four and a half years ago, we started building a niche marketing business focused entirely on infrastructure and natural resources, primarily mining. And then now we also do training and development. So we've built a training software platform from the ground up this year, and I've populated it with over 500 training videos, 500 more on the way in the next 60 days. And we are full bore on the, the, the training frontier as well. So you don't get to uh, so so as a child as a child you never left the sandbox. No, uh, with the with, with with the dream of being able to continue to play in the sandbox. That's it. And like you said, you 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 fell into a more of a a, a, a marketing and now a, a kind of more of a, a software based training program. But you still get to go play in the sandbox. I'm around equipment all the time. Last week I was in the oil sands, uh, some of the biggest mining operations in the world in Northern Alberta, for example. Next week I'll be going to Tampa, Chicago, and Denver to go look at earth moving operations. So that's all I do is just run around the country and world now looking at some of the coolest earthwork infrastructure mining projects around. So on the, the, the marketing side in terms of, uh, uh, so build wit. So what are the, what are those, like, um, the, the civil contracting companies coming to you 
uh, asking for your help on? So all blue collar companies in general right now have a big problem and they have a people problem. They can't uh, attract the workforce. They need to go fill the demand. And even if demand goes down temporarily, that's only going to make the problem worse. Ironically enough, this problem is going to persist until we do something different about it. So they're realizing that mm, this whole strategy of not telling anybody about what we do is starting to catch up with us. And we don't necessarily win work based on who knows our name. But from a people standpoint, we need to start getting the word out about what we do, why we do it, how we do it, so that our current workforce is, is engaged and retained and inspired. And then the next generation also joins our ranks as well. So these companies reach out to us because they see what we do online. We reach a few million people every, every day on social media, which is remarkable. They reach out to us and they say, hey, we have a great story. We would love you to tell it. So we sit down with them and basically ask them, you know, tell us your story. You know, what makes you guys you? And we put it into words. We develop websites for them, you know, you know, create a brand that actually means something that they can then take to their workforce, take to their their new workers and explain who they are, video projects, photography, all of that. It's all about telling these companies stories to inspire the next generation, to make sure the current workforce is inspired. Because if we don't take care of our current workforce, we have no right to go attract the next generation in the first place. And then just to remind people how critical infrastructure and natural resources are to their daily living, because no one could do anything without their food, water, shelter needs met. And that's what this industry does. Interesting. So, so essentially you, you, you fell into the, it's a, it's a marketing role, not to build a book of business per se, yeah. but to support the resources needed to execute on your book of business on a on a on a continual basis into the future in terms of building the workforce. Yeah, this industry revolves around human beings and that's not going away anytime soon. So you can leverage technology to make your human beings more effective and more intelligent in the, how they build, but the human component of construction, it's never going away. And uh, we have basically just kind of stumbled into our workforce. Historically, we haven't had to work for our workforce. And that's because past generations, they just wanted a good job. Construction provided that. Okay, my dad did construction, so I'm going to go work in construction. But now the year is 2022. The world has changed. This next generation has a lot of opportunities. This next generation has higher education. This next generation has never been told about infrastructure because their parents probably did something different. So it's all about adapting the industry to today's world, because whether we like it or not, the world's change. And so until we recognize that, accept that and start working with it, we're still going to have this people problem. So an instigating question Please. here, um, and, and I, I already know, uh, I already know your, your answer. So I'm going to just throw the softball over there um, is technology taking away jobs or replacing people because i hear that i hear i hear that a lot from from the old times yeah which is it's a fair um it's a fair concern of theirs but i've i've i meet with all of the latest technology groups across the industry and in, in, in the united states and in worldwide now technology only makes people more effective and a great example of of this is the autonomous equipment like built robotics for example they're fully automating an excavator to dig a trench. That's that's their big uh, their big project right now. So what does that do? Uh, well, it, it does take a person out of that machine digging a trench, but now that person can go focus on more valuable tasks that are more mentally stimulating, require creativity that only humans have. And then not only is the work more fulfilling, but that person also gets paid more because the operation is more efficient. So technology is really just there to make people more effective. And whether you like it or not, it's a reality, again, of 2022. So if you're, if you're uh, an, a, you know, smart and if you're ambitious, you're going to be saying, how can I take my skill set, my creativity, everything I know today, whether I'm young or old, and leverage technology to make my foundation, make what I have to offer the industry even more effective? Um, which is really cool to see. It's amazing to see some guy running a blade in his 50s, fully leveraging GPS machine control and absolutely obliterating his current his previous production numbers without GPS. 
because he said, hey, I can do this more effectively with it. I still have this skill set. It doesn't make the need for that skill set to vanish. You still need to know how the machine runs. You still need to know how dirt interacts with the environment. You still need to know how to read a set of plans. But if you can marry that with the technology, you can do some really remarkable things. I also feel like there's there's technology is creating greater longevity in careers. Like just purely on terms of like the manual side of things and the the, the the punishment on bodies, like exoskeletons. If people are are leveraging exoskeletons starting off in their twenties and thirties, they're they're not they're not their bodies aren't completely demolished by the time they're thirty five. Yeah. I have a friend who um uh right out of college uh was a Mason. And honestly, by the time he was 35, he was done. He couldn't, he couldn't physically do it anymore. But now with technology, things like that, 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 whether it's robotics that are doing things for you or the exoskeletons that are allowing you to do things a little bit easier, um, getting a lot more longevity out of your career as well. Yeah. The, the technology conversation is actually really exciting because there are a lot of jobs in society that are in danger of being automated and will be automated because that person is just repeating something over and over again, even coding. AI is going to start to take on a lot of that. But creative endeavors is something that's uniquely human. And building things is creative. There's no right or wrong way to do it. The variables are always changing. Every project's completely different. So it's always going to require humans, which creates this huge opportunity. You have this industry that needs people. So if I'm a young person looking at the blue collar field at these trades, that is probably the single biggest opportunity in society right now. So flipping back over to the like the workforce workforce development conversation uh, from a previous conversation that you and I had, um, you know, it's like, how do you attract the next generation of construction professionals? And a lot of times people will say, oh, well, show the type of technology we have. And I believe what you said was, that's not it. That That's table stakes now. Like te the technology isn't the thing that wows them and makes them want, want to come. So what what is the thing that brings in the next generation into the into the construction yeah, industry? Yeah, the, the, the technology thing is so funny because all these companies are so fixated on, oh, we need to show us, show the technology. That's going to bring the kids. I'm like, who cares? And And great, you have GPS, you have great control. So does everybody else. Like this, this industry is, is really behind from a technological standpoint. I'll use my phone, which is a beautiful UX UI design. I'll use my car play in my, in my truck. Everything's great. And then I'll get into construction. I'm like, what happened? What, what is going on here, guys? It's so, it's, it's oftentimes frustrating. <laughs> we're somewhat behind and, and we don't, we think we're competing with other construction companies, but we're competing with other industries that are 10 years beyond what we're doing. Um, so it is important. That does help you become more effective, but that's not what's not what's going to attract the next generation. The next generation, everybody wants this magic bullet. Oh, if we just do this, we're going to solve our people problem. The, the reality is humans are complex and humans want to be cared for. Humans want to be part of a, a compelling team. Humans want to contribute to something greater than themselves. So to solve the workforce problem, it's a little, it's a little counterintuitive Every company needs to look at look themselves in the mirror and say, how do we care for our existing workforce more effectively? How do we train our leaders to care for the people out in the field? How do we make sure that they have a little bit of balance in their lives, that they're not working consistently 75 hours a week and they're getting divorced and they're alcoholics and they're suicidal and have and, and are addicted to, to drugs? You know, the industry has the number one construction industry is number one for suicide out of any industry, which is wild. So we need to start by caring for our existing workforce. And if we care for our existing workforce, if they're inspired, if they love their work, they're going to go tell people about it. They're going to raise their kids with the hope that they get into it. It's going to solve itself. But the problem is the industry has historically treated humans like inputs. They're laborers, they're operators, they're foremen. They're just a, a line item on a bid that's labor hours. They're no more than that. And a lot of companies say that's not how they do things, but you go out to the field and it kind of is how they do things. So 
I think technology is great. That's fantastic, but that's not going to solve the people problem. What's going to solve the people problem is caring for our workforce, is investing in leadership, is training people on things like financial literacy, is asking how can we make our schedule just a little bit more sustainable. So Billy, who has two young twins at home, 26 years old, can at least have a Saturday off every once in a while, which isn't too much to ask. Those are the kind of things I think we need to focus on. And until we do that, it's this problem is going to persist. I like that your your existing workforce is going to be your 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 biggest marketing piece for future generations. Easily, but it's not everybody. Is that, is that basic? I, I, I get everybody wants this magic potion that they drink and their problem is solved because they're up against tight deadlines right now. They're turning down work. They have the greatest backlog they've ever had right now. Their people are retiring. There's a lot of people pressure there. They just want the problem solved today so they can keep doing, doing what they've, what they've done and what's made them a lot of money. But that's just, that's not reality. And this sounds like wishful thinking, but I've seen very large contractors adopt this exact approach where the executives look themselves in the mirror and say, how can we care for our current workforce more effectively? How can we invest in our current workforce more effectively? How can we do better as leaders? They do that. And within a few years, they don't have a workforce problem right now. They don't have a retention problem right now. They don't. They don't have the problem. So so what are uh do you have like anecdotal you don't have to say this company's doing this, but like do you have anecdotal stories of like some of the things that they're inherently changing or programs they're putting in place? Do you have do you have a a handful of stories? Um a company like Hoopa in in Charlotte, they're among the best examples I've found. They're they're remarkable and they've been really good to our business. But they, they've built a whole academy. So they have a dedicated training academy within their business. And they have taken it upon themselves to train the operators, train the foreman, train everybody they need to make their business successful. And their saying is, if it's raining, we're training. So if it rains and they're raining out, a lot of companies, they just send their people home and say, sorry, you don't get paid today, which sucks. These people have mortgages. These people have families. These people have bills they need to pay. And so having their income go up and down, that's, that's not always sustainable. So they've tried to even that out. And it's not perfect, but they've tried to even that out by then. Hey, we can't work today, but we're going to invest in you today. We're going to train you on how to be a better leader. We're going to put you on our equipment simulators. We're going to go to our sandbox in the back and talk about grade stakes and how to read grade stakes. So they invest in their people. And if I'm a young person that goes to work for a contractor, and day one or month one or whatever it is, they start to invest in me. That shows me, wow, these people care about my success. I'm not going to go leave for a dollar raise because these people care about me. And this is the first time I've felt cared about before. It's a really low bar to step over, but that is where the industry is. And a company like Hoopa, I think, is, is among the best examples of this. That's exciting. I, I absolutely love that. And that... Is that essentially the motivation that that made you go from the the uh, build with purely just marketing piece into the build? Uh, I think it's called build with leaders. Is so that it's, right? it's now build with training. So build with leaders was our first our leadership training platform for the dirt world. We put that out there. It was a little too aspirational. All the companies they want skills based because they have to do one of two things: make their current workforce more effective or bring new people up to speed quickly. So that's skills based. So we revamped it. We built a platform from scratch that has leadership, but also has how to lay pipe, how to do things safely, that kind of thing. Yeah. But the motivation was <laughs> the motivation was going to these association meetings, going to these industry meetings, going to these workforce development summits, whatever they may be, and hearing the same conversation every single meeting, every single year. Everybody has just kind of put their hands up in the air. Like we have this problem but we have no idea what to do. And after seeing that for years and years and years and me being in my 20s, I have 30, 40 years ahead of me. I'm sitting here, I'm like, we need to do something about this. And BuildWit was in a unique and is in a unique position because we don't bid against people. We're not a competitor to anybody. We have this large online brand, people are cheering for us. So we said, why don't we leverage our unique position in the industry and start to train and educate and and and, and, and inspire that next generation at scale. And the only way to do that was through software. So that's why we did it. And it's funny, one of my 
one of the people I've followed in business is Yvonne Chouinard, who started Patagonia. He calls himself a reluctant businessman. I feel like it's cool to own a tech company, to be a tech company founder. I call myself a reluctant tech company executive because it's like, I didn't want a tech company. I don't want to run a software. I don't know anything about software, but that is our role in the industry. And that's what we're here to do. I love it. So some, you, you kind of fall into things at times and, and you see, you see the path and you're like, it's not exactly what I had pictured for myself, but it does make sense. That's it. Um, so this experience for you, uh, and you alluded to this in terms of where you've been and like where you're going in, uh, uh, next week, uh, share with us some of, uh, and, and if anybody's following you on, 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 on Instagram or any of the, any, any of your social, and please feel free to share that with, uh, with, with the audience, but tell us about some of the, some of the coolest places and some of the coolest things that you've seen, um, in terms of like the places. And, and I think there's a tie in here and let me know if I'm right, is that part of the reasons why you go visit these places is to show people, if you get into this industry, you have an opportunity to go do the, do do this cool stuff in these cool places that may not normally bring you there in your normal in your yeah. normal life. So, kind of share with the audience in terms of some of the some of the uh, uh, travels that you go on and some of the things sure. that you see. I, I I hear all the time. Oh, you guys are making construction cool again. You're making it sexy again. And I sit there and think, no, it's cool. It's it just is cool. I'm just showing it. I, I, it's always been that it, way. It's cool. It's always been cool. It's going to be cool. I am just there with the camera, giving people access to it for the first time, which is is exciting and necessary. Um, so that's what I do. I travel a lot. Uh, almost every week of this year, I've been traveling to go out, experience the industry for two reasons: to share the industry with as many people as we can. Again, we reach a lot of people on social media, which is awesome. And then to inform our business, to go talk to the people in the industry and learn about what their real problems are so that we can take that back to our business and create solutions for them. Um, but just this year, we ramped up. I've probably been to over 30 states this year. And then we ramped up international travel. So my first trip of the year was actually to Saudi Arabia to go see a lot of their really large earth moving operations across the country, which was unbelievable, unbelievable to scale of of the work out there. And then in April, I went to Switzerland to visit with some demolition contractors, which was extremely inspiring because they're five to 10 years beyond where the United States is. And everything is so specialized. Wow. Yep. Every machine is tailor made to the exact application. The Swiss just think about things and everything made sense. It was spectacular to see. Um, and then last week we went to Alberta and, and British Columbia to see some of the mining operations that I've always wanted to see the oil sands. So you have hundreds and hundreds of 400 ton ultra class mining trucks getting filled by fleets of shovels. And the scale was just mind boggling. So we try to see all of this because one of the core problems of the dirt world is that everybody lives in their own little world. Everybody's in their own little silo. Everybody's bidding against each other. So everybody plays their cards real close to the chest and there's very little sharing. And so since we're not a competitor, we can wander around all these sites and show them off and educate people on here's how other people do things. And it might be completely different from how you do it. And it might be better or it might just be different. Both of your guys' ways are doing it are, are right. Um, so we've really opened opened a new level of transparency to the industry, I think, over the past few years. And it's only starting to accelerate. All right, so I'm going to kind of throw a a, a a double double sided question to you, to or a two tier sure. question to you. So, if you had um, a group of potential construction industry workers, they're making a decision on which path they want to go down. What would be the pitch that you can give right now as to why getting in this industry is such a fantastic idea? And then I want maybe a, a futuristic one because you you have all these great efforts to try to make to help the workforce development and make it even, an even better place so then it will be what would be the futuristic one like the or the the utopian type of 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 scenario pitch as to why you want to be involved in the construction industry of the 
future. And the future could be five years, 10 years, 15 years. I, I, don't care. I think initially it's the camaraderie is, is unlike anywhere else you'll find the, the, the bonds you have with the people you work with are really, really tight. You're working outside, which is so compelling. You're not under terrible fluorescent lighting all day, stuck in an office. You're, you're in different locations. There's always new challenges. You can, you can work really hard, which I think humans are made to do work really hard. And at the end of the day, not only are you exhausted, but you can see what you just did, which is so fulfilling. So you can drive by that bridge with your children one day and say, I did that. I had a hand in that. And then you get to work around big equipment. Who doesn't want to work around big equipment? It's awesome. Everybody loves it. Men, women, children. It doesn't matter where you're from, what your socioeconomic status is. It is like one of the great unifiers. We've put so many people that have never been in a machine before in a machine and they don't shut up about it afterwards. So there's, there's a lot it has going for it. I think future state, I'm going to take this a little differently. Future state, I shouldn't have to work as hard to tell the next generation, tell these people about the industry. They should already know about it. They should already be like, yeah, I know I, I want to go. It should be sought after because why, why not? I don't see a good reason why the construction industry, why moving dirt, why building things can't be sought after because I think it aligns so nicely with human nature. So nicely. We're physical creatures. We're social creatures. We're, we're built to work hard. We're built to create. This industry has all of those things and you can get paid really well. So it takes care of your, your, your socioeconomic needs as well. And you can care for your family and give them the life you want, want them to live as well. So I think ideally we can solve this people problem so that kids and parents are saying, parents are saying, Hey, if my kid does want to be in the industry, in the construction industry, I think that's fantastic. And I would be really, really proud to have them in that industry. And I hope that kids, like you go, you go out to a six year old playground. What's everybody doing? Everybody's playing. Everybody's imagining. Everybody's digging in the dirt. Everybody's playing with trucks. And then somehow it gets beaten out of us. You go, you go, you go to, uh, you know, you, you start to grow up, you go through high school and it's all about choosing a, a real career. But what, where did that go? It's just beaten out of us. But what if we can foster that through someone, a young person's life so that when they do get to 18, they realize, oh my gosh, I love trucks. I love digging the dirt and I can do this as a career too. Why not? That's awesome. So I, I'm really yeah. optimistic because I think it's a, it's a big challenge to solve, but I don't see why we can't solve it. And I, I want to throw in, let's not neglect. Uh, I'll be bl blunt about it the nerds out there, right? Like yeah. I was one of them. So I, uh, I'm happy, I'm happy to say, happy to say it that, you know what, maybe working with your hands, working on construction isn't, isn't the thing that floats your boat, but there uh, you, you started this conversation with how you go, you go from your, your, your user interface within your car and on your phone to the user interface of the technology that's out there on the construction sites. There's a large opportunity to affect technology uh, uh, it, within the construction industry. And there's going to be a lot of opportunities yeah. there. So even if, if coding, if you're, if you know, you're, you're into coding, um, you shouldn't necessarily always just be thinking about, sorry, you know, Google, Apple, Amazon, uh, you know, Microsoft, all, all of them. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities to, to still be involved. And, and by the way, gets you out onto the site because, you, whether you're coding software or you're helping engineer a new piece of of survey equipment or whatever it is, you got to know how it's done out on uh, down done out on the field, so it gets you out there as well. So there's plenty of opportunity on on the technology and that, that's side. Absolutely spot on. Yeah, you, I mean, and and you can be a lawyer in construction, you can be an accountant in construction, and I I'm yeah. an idiot, and I have a software company in the construction industry. So if I can do it, somebody who's actually technologically inclined. <laughs> can do some pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool stuff. That's awesome. Um, so as I, I mentioned in our, in our pre-show meeting, this thing always flies by. And here we are. We're actually at the end. Um, final question. And um, I'm, uh, I'm not sure if I told you this one, so I'm sorry if I'm springing this question on you. It's a question that we ask every single guest at the end of our, our, our episodes is, um, either what is your motto or, 
you don't necessarily ha- have a motto. What's a motto that you've that you've heard that you find to be very interesting and inspiring? I just I go pretty quickly to our mission of we're here to make the dirt world a better place. Um, and I've I've been told I need to explain dirt world a little bit better. That's infrastructure mining, but it's every but everything we've talked about. It's you know what's your why? Why do you get out of bed? Why do you do what you do? Like this year is is in a lot of ways sucked. It's building a company. It's, <laughs> I mean, building a software company, we we <laughs> had no idea what we were doing. We didn't have anything December. And then we decide, let's go build a software company. And so here we are. It's going really well. It's exciting, but it's been it's been tough. And if I didn't have that, why am I doing it? Very clear purpose. There would have been no way I, I'm sitting here. There would I would have thrown in the towel so long ago. So that is it's it's on the wall of our office. It's something I think about every day. We're here to make the dirt world a better place. And uh, we're doing that through educating people, through telling stories, and it's starting to really become a reality, which is, I, I think, very exciting. That's awesome. Uh, Aaron Witt, CEO at BuildWit. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I've enjoyed what, which I, I think, um, anybody who's listening or watching this will, will, will be able to feel the passion that you have around this topic and, and understand what you just said in terms of that, that the why drives you every single day. So thank you so much, uh, for, for joining sure. us on the Thanks show for today. Me, man. I appreciate it. And everybody who's listening or watching, thank you very much for joining in. Um, Till next time, this is the Connected Construction Show. I'm Matt Sprague. Stay connected. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Connected Construction Show. For more information, visit us at connectedconstructionshow.com.